My next destination is mile marker 73 on Lower Matacumbi Key near Matacumbi Harbor. I'm heading out to the next wreck site, the San Felipe, nicknamed El Larry. The second shipwreck in Galleon Alley, El Larry is number 12 on the old chart. She is about 2.3 miles, 220 degrees to the southwest from San Pedro. The land bearings are three Norfolk pine trees. Align the middle pine tree on the right quadrant of the light colored roof. The middle pine tree is about 320 degrees from El Larry. Also, the Calusa Cove boat barn is about 275 degrees west northwest from the wreck site. Today I have such great visibility, I can see the sand pocket from 40 yards away. When anchoring on any of these historic wreck sites, I always drop anchor in sand downwind and down current from the ballast. This way, if the anchor drags, it will not damage the wreck site. El Larry was an English-built merchant nao of over 500 tons. American elm wood was used in her rigging components. She was over 100 feet long and 30 feet wide. El Larry was owned by Guillermo Terry and the Marques de Canada, Garcia Baquero. Her nickname, El Larry, came from the owner's last name, Terry. Her captain, Don Joseph Villari Andrade, was in charge of 13 officers, 100 sailors, seven pages, and a mostly organic cargo with some silver specie and gold bullion. Most of her passengers survived the disaster, and she was thoroughly salvaged by the Spanish. All of the 1733 wreck sites have been heavily impacted by modern salvage efforts, with virtually their entire ballast mounds disturbed. El Larry has the most intact ballast mound of any of the 1733 wreck sites. She's situated perpendicular to shore. The seaward portion of the ballast covering the bow of the ship is a solid mound of round Portuguese river rock, 50 feet long and five to six feet tall. The shoreward portion of the ballast is over 40 feet long, yet only two feet tall indicating extensive modern salvage. She was rediscovered and initially salvaged by the Roberts brothers, Doc Wellberry and Buddy Crane in 1961. As one of Florida's oldest artificial reefs, El Larry has supported a diverse living marine community for over two and three quarter centuries. Despite her enormous ballast mound that seemed to indicate certain treasure, very little gold or silver has been recovered from this wreck site. El Larry is my favorite wreck site of the 1733 fleet. Visibility here sometimes exceeds 40 feet. The 20-foot anchor of El Larry stands in front of Cobra Marine on Snake Creek near mile marker 86. El Larry was a big ship and she had an impressive anchor. After crossing the majestic Channel 5 bridge, I'm heading to Fiesta Key near mile marker 70 to meet my dive buddy, Karen McKee. 
Karen and I are heading out to dive a pair of nearby wrecks in the heart of Galleon Alley. They built them back because they were, you know, they were grouper and we were petting them and everything. We turned them into pets while we were catching the rats and then they couldn't stand to kill them, so they throw back. The next wreck on the old chart is number 13, El Gran Poder de Dios y Santa Ana, or the Great Power of God and St. Anne. She was reportedly refloated by the Spanish. If the keel of a ship remained solid after running aground, the vessel could usually be saved. Our first target, San Francisco de Assis, is number 14 on the old chart. Nicknamed the Craig Wreck by locals, it's about 1.1 miles, 330 degrees north-northwest to the beginning of the Channel 5 bridge. She's in eight feet of water with a relatively intact ballast mound and visibility that often exceeds 30 feet. She's protected from the unpredictable, strong currents of Channel 2 and Channel 5 by Craig Key. San Francisco was an English-built, 265-ton merchant now. She was owned by Don Cristobal de Urquijo. Due to her shallow depth, Spanish salvers recovered nearly all of her silver, but her organic cargo of indigo, animal hides, and tobacco was lost. Karen's dad, Art McKee, knew about the Craig wreck. Said Karen, we drove down to Key West, he pointed right out from that embankment, he says, there's a good wreck out there. He says, if it's in shallow water, he says, it might find me some coins on it. Karen dives with a hooker rig, just like her father, Art. Karen quickly discovers a West Indian sea egg. This odd-looking creature is a member of the sea urchin family. Nearby, a slate pencil urchin resides next to the base of a small colony of finger coral. Karen points out the ever-present angelfish that thrive on all of the 1733 wreck sites. San Francisco is alive with tiny schoolies. Here we have the shyest resident of the Craig wreck, a 15-pound red grouper. San Francisco is situated parallel to shore. Karen has discovered her keelson, the main support timber for the keel. The first foothook of each rib is clearly visible, supported by sturdy riders. A large consignment of leather was on San Francisco's manifest. Here, fused to this ballast stone, is all that remains of a 280-year-old piece of cowhide that went down with the ship. Treasure hunting legend Captain Carl Fismer has made some impressive silver cob coin recoveries nearby this wreck site in recent years. Situated in water not much deeper than a backyard swimming pool, San Francisco is easy to locate, making her a perfect site for snorkelers as well as divers. We're skipping one mile, 220 degrees southwest from San Francisco into Channel 5 near Long Key Point. The Spanish named Long Key Cayo Vibora or Rattlesnake Key due to the shape of this unusual island. The next target, known locally as the Cannonball Wreck, is number 15 on the old chart, the vice flagship of the Armada, La Almiranta. 
captained by Don Bernardino de Maturana. Her proper name was Nuestra Senora de Balvaneda, and she was nicknamed El Gallo Indiana, or Cock of the Indies. She bristled with over 60 cannon and carried a huge payload of silver coins and copper ingots. The Spanish salvaged most of her copper and silver within a few months after the disaster. However, they left behind a keg or two of bronze nails. Thousands of these tacks were recovered just seaward of the ballast in the mid-1970s. Bronze is a copper tin alloy, often with trace amounts of zinc, giving it a brilliant, almost golden hue after restoration. This bronze nail was submerged in the ocean for 243 years. Other than a light green patina, it is as solid now as the day it was cast. This eight real silver cob coin was recovered about 150 yards seaward to the southeast of her ballast in 1976. In the next episode, volume 24 of Key's Dive Guide, we'll learn more about Spanish colonial coins, including their various denominations. La Almiranta was rediscovered by Captain Tim Watkins and his Buccaneer Salvage Group in 1960. From the wreck site, it's about 272 degrees to the west to the large radar tower on the seaward side of Long Key. I also line up the Red Channel 5 marker with the 6th concrete bridge support from the west end of the new Channel 5 bridge. The bridge support is about 340 degrees north-northwest from the wreck site. In front of Calusa Cove Resort stands a gigantic 20-foot galleon anchor reportedly recovered from this wreck site. This anchor is definitely big enough to tame the 500-ton King's Galleon, La Almiranta. This is an immense ballast mound, 150 feet long and 50 feet wide, with some of the largest stones on any of the 1733 wreck sites. In the mid-1970s, La Almiranta's ballast was peppered with pottery and glass shards. Today, her ballast has been picked cleaner than a hound's tooth. Four people drowned when she shuddered to an ungainly halt in her final resting place. Visibility on this site is generally poor, 10 feet or less, especially when the outgoing tide brings the cloudy, sediment-laden waters of the Gulf of Mexico through Channel 5. Nonetheless, Karen and I plow through the murky water to the wreck site. As vice flagship, La Almiranta protected the rear of the fleet. Locals have always called this site the Cannonball Wreck, due to the Cannonball conglomerate strewn over the area. The numerous depressions in the conglomerate once held 9, 12, and 18-pound cannonballs. This is one of her 9-pound cannonballs, recovered with a pick, chisel, and hammer, using the same techniques Art McKee used 38 years previously on La Capitana. Notice the pitted, pockmarked condition of this munition. Part of the rusted iron stayed attached to the conglomerate which was discarded. That's why this nine pound cannonball only weighs about six and three quarter pounds. Conglomerate is an incrustation that forms around objects submerged in salt water. This is a small piece of conglomerate surrounding what used to be an iron nail. The nail has completely disintegrated. The iron rust is diffused into the incrustation. Near her keel amidship, covered with ballast, is a huge cache of fossilized gunpowder, another key ingredient in her offensive and defensive capabilities. In front of Calusa Cove Resort, several of La Almiranta's cannon are on display. This one is called a nine-pounder because she would fire nine-pound projectiles with deadly accuracy for distances up to three quarters of a mile. Cannons of this era generally weighed 250 pounds per pound of shot fired. 
Located in 12 feet of water on the inner edge of Channel 5, this wreck site can be a tough dive. Unpredictable currents and large channel sharks warrant the respect of all navigators and divers. As always, I've had a great time diving with my friend Karen McKee. Well, we picked a good day for it. Water.